Hello, everyone, and welcome to Measuring and Transforming Corporate Culture to Minimize Risks and Improve Valuation. Now, corporate culture, while a significant contributor to an organization's competitive advantage as an intangible asset, it can also turn into a liability with a lack of oversight and governance from organizational leaders. We are happy to have with us today Stuart Levine, the Chairman and CEO at Stuart Levine and & Associates, and Brian Revell, Chairman and CEO at Revell Research Group, to discuss the governance challenges as it pertains to corporate culture. My name is Michael E. Rubin, your moderator and a member of the Onboard Board Management Software team. First, a little housekeeping before we begin. After the webinar, today we will be sending out a recording of the webinar, and you will also be able to download the presentation. During the webinar, please feel free to enter your questions right in the GoToMeeting panel. We will try to get to as many of your questions during the webinar today in the time we have. Now, I would like to do a brief introduction of our co-presenters. First, we have Stuart Levine, Board Chair and CEO of Stuart Levine & Associates. Stuart is a board governance expert and currently serves on the board of Broad Ridge Financial Solutions as the chairman of the Governance and Nominating Committee and a member of the Audit Committee. In addition to more than 25 years of helping CEOs and boards build stronger, value-driven, and profitable organizations, Stuart has served on over 15 publicly traded for-profit and non-for-profit boards. He is the author of the international best-selling books, The Six Fundamentals of Success and Cut to the Chase, and over 99 other rules to liberate yourself and gain back the gift of time. And finally, he has been named Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young and Inc. Magazine. Welcome, Stuart. Next, well, we have thanks. Brian Revell. Next, we have Brian Revell, Chairman and CEO of Revell Research Group. Revell is a data-driven management consulting firm that helps companies improve valuation, mitigate risk, and drive performance with data-backed confidence. The firm works with 63 companies on the S&P 100 and over half of the S&P 500. Brian first joined Revell Research Group in 1994 and became president in 2000. Since then, he has guided the firm to become the largest provider of global perception studies. In addition, Brian is a frequent presenter to board members, management teams, and communications professionals on how research can add value to an organization by building competitive advantage. Welcome, Brian. And without Thanks. further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the conversation over to Stuart Levine and Brian Revell. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And as we begin our conversation today, I want to uh, acknowledge our host today, uh, and that is uh, Tarta Krinsky and Drogan, uh, partner Guy Molinari, for hosting us uh, in New York City. We appreciate that so much. We're joined today by uh, members of the uh, SLNA team uh, Harriet Levine, our president of our firm, and Kelly Bliss, managing uh, director. Brian, we are operating and functioning in, in a business world that is uh, experiencing unprecedented amount of change. Uh, we see market uncertainty, uh, lack of trust. Uh, we as stu stewards of, of capitalism really have some very serious questions to analyze and set forth in strategy going forward. And most importantly, what sits on all of those conversations are creating sustainable cultures that are accretive uh, to shareholders. Uh, interestingly enough, as we were uh, talking about uh, coming together and bringing this content, and let me also uh, share with you that we've been working with Passageways for over four years today in webinars like this because we share values of learning and sharing independent content. And I think you are, Brian, you and your firm are a great example of what I would call the power of independently collected data and what it implies for the workforce and for shareholders. A number of years ago when I was CEO of Dale Carnegie uh, training, I was walking through our offices and I came into the finance department and uh, there were two, uh, I'll call it senior level people, having a heated discussion about God only knows what. And as I looked at them, they were doing this in front of one of those uh, great posters of two people rowing on a tranquil lake, you know, of peace and love. And I mm -hmm. turned to them and I said, wow, this uh, poster program's really worked. It brought home to my mind 
the incredible importance of data and what it implies for dignity and what it implies for results. So on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for coming and uh, sure, Bray. Yeah, yeah. so it, 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 it's, it's funny you say that and you've shared that story with me before. And I, I, I think that's so apropos as, as we approach this discussion. You know, as my friend Erica Keswin likes to say, uh, it's not about what's on the walls, it's about what's in the halls. And taking culture from just a something that's done because, well, we think it's a good thing, to actually embracing it and having it flow throughout an organization. It's one thing to have it posted around the office, it's another to live it. So I, I think that was a, that is a perfect example of what it is we're going to talk about. Yeah, and, and so as you look at our agenda today, we're going to talk about culture uh, and strategy and the implications for performance, risk, and valuation. I want to also remind our participants that we have uh, three questions that are uh, designed to let people tell us what they're thinking, and I would also encourage you uh, through your technology portal to send us any questions you have on your mind. And on behalf of Brian and myself, we'll commit if we don't get your questions answered uh, throughout this cycle, uh, we will call you back and, and try to be responsive uh, to that. But we're interested in what you have to say and what questions. I would observe, Brian, as we look at the agenda, 90% uh, of the data that we are making business decisions on today uh, have been generated in the last two years. And that implies the incredible uh, change that cultures and the way we define culture, it's, it's one behavior at a time. And uh, so it's not some big amorphous uh, conversation. And, and that type of data implies profound change on people. And so issues like values and how we come together in the marketplace is incredibly important. Uh, artificial intelligence and what that denotes. And the example I can give you kind of fast is, so 10 years ago, uh, we saw a trend in the United States uh, particularly where in a manu if you were a manufacturing supervisor, somebody came over, patted you on the back and said, by the way, I want you to meet Guy. Uh, he is now taking your job and you train him for three months and he's taking that back to India. We're at the threshold of something more profound than cultures today because as we start to see artificial intelligence work its way into the marketplace, we believe that we're on the cusp of very serious social unrest which says, okay, Guy, it's not that the job is getting offshore. It's you'll now report through artificial intelligence to a robot. And that is going to imply an incredible, I'll call it upskilling, uptraining of people to make sure, and I believe the social responsibility of capitalism going forward implies that we reinvest our capital in people so that they can compete and live uh, productive lives. So those are some of the conversations uh, we'll be having uh, with you today. And, yes. Yeah, Brent. and people people talk a lot about culture, and it's it's one of the buzzwords that we're seeing uh, that, that that's going around. You read about it in the news almost every day. People talk a lot about culture, but they don't relate it to strategy, and they don't tie it back to performance. And one of the things we want to do today and accomplish in this webinar is. Uh, the why, the what, and the how uh, culture relates to strategy and performance. And, and hopefully you walk away from this, uh, this webinar with actionable items that uh, you can take back to your organizations and make a difference. So, Brian, if we go to the next slide, um, when we talk about intangible assets, so back in the day when people spoke about intangible assets uh, like people and culture, uh, people, and you kind of still hear it in the marketplace, uh, talk about it in the sense that it were soft skills, soft, uh, implying it wasn't really material uh, to the outcome. But today we see a shift, a dramatic shift. Uh, uh, over 52% of a car, uh, company's uh, market value now being viewed in talent and culture. And something even more interesting and I know you're going to talk a little bit about BlackRock and what you heard from State Street and what Vanguard is saying. But when Jay Clayton, uh, who is uh, a very, I'll call it, thoughtful and effective SEC chair, is now saying for the first time that human capital disclosures should become part, should be considered for part of a proxy, other uh, cues and other uh, 
uh, filings to ensure that there is a modernization in the framework that rep recreates that recognizes the intangible asset. To me, that's a really important societal uh, shift. And I you want to share? Yeah, yeah go ahead. 100%. So, listen, we uh, we do a lot of research on this on this topic, and uh, we 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 recently saw in a study that we did 82% of investors in North America and Europe that that vote the proxy, the people that are responsible for voting the proxy, look for signs of corporate culture in the proxy statement and other filings, 82%. They're looking for this. So State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock, they're on the leading edge of, of this movement. And they're all starting to focus on culture. They're all asking questions of CEOs and board members. Uh, State Street is, is I, I, would, I would say, leading the charge on these discussions. So what, what I would say to you here is the key takeaways, be prepared to talk about this going forward uh, in investor meetings. Some of the questions they're asking uh, yeah, the, our clients are talking to us about this. What is your company culture? How would you describe it? Uh, to what degree is culture an advantage for you? Uh, how does your board influence culture? Uh, to, how do you use culture as an advantage in recruiting? Uh, how is your culture different in the U.S. versus Europe versus Asia if you're a, a multinational? Um, how do you how do you gather data on culture to bring about change? Uh, they, they go on and on, but these are some of the questions. And uh, again, Stuart and I, uh, as Stuart mentioned, will be available offline if you have any more questions about uh, these things and what they're, what kind of questions they're asking. Uh, but it's one of the reasons we uh, we decided to get into this biz business of, of measuring values. Uh, we're starting to see it in in the research that we're doing, and we're starting to see it as a uh, a driver of investment decisions. And so uh, this is this is here to stay. So Brian, we uh, had a, a, a call from a reporter last week, and she was asking me questions related to this subject. How do you measure culture? What data should the board be looking for to really understand and get their hands around it? And then how do they work with the CEO and the C-suite? And here are some practical, I'll call it, points of view that I want to share uh, with our participants today. Number one, as a board member, I'm really interested in understanding employee satisfaction, not on an annual basis, but on a regularized basis, which starts to give me leading insights into the culture. Employee turnover by region, which also helps us identify if we have strengths and or weaknesses in leadership uh, throughout the organization. Client satisfaction today, if you can't hold on to existing clients, you debunk and devalue, I'll call it the total valuation of the uh, corporation. And then succession planning. Again, as a board person, traditionally, member, uh, we would see the NEOs. But we have people today from uh, credit unions, other financial services, healthcare sector on, on the line with us. And succession planning is something that we've been doing quite a bit of work on. And it's not only if the CEO decides to leave, retire, or gets hit on the head with a geranium, but what type of talent are we developing 50 people below so that, as an example, that tells me as a director, if I meet you, uh, Brian, for a cup of coffee, how effective that CEO is in attracting talent. And so those casual meetings of a larger group not necessarily today's next CEO, but certainly tell us how we're developing. And those type of metrics really, I'll call it, uh, set up a, a really interesting context. And then for me, the values and mission, which I know we'll spend a lot of time talking about, but people say, well, how do you measure that? How do you know it? I want to know at every governance meeting what the 800 numbers responses look like of hotline people calling in and saying, gee whiz, we have a problem, uh, whatever the heck that problem is. And hopefully most of them are what you and I would call below the line. But our experience tells us that the frequency and the rhythm that's developed tells us quite a bit about the organization. So those four or five uh, data points will really help directors, CEOs, and senior leaders, I think, think their way through how do we get data around this uh, value. So if we go to the uh, next uh, slide, the culture and shareholder value. 
So basically here we talk about uh, culture, values, and beliefs. And uh, remember that what may be counterintuitive, and this is, I think, when you get a little deep on, on values, because values, by definition, are beliefs. They never change. But it gives us the self-confidence to have innovative discussions, challenging discussions about new products, new services, and values become an incredibly important differentiator uh, for organizations. So when uh, you go into a shareholders meeting and you ask a question about what the heck are our values, that starts to tell you if people really understand them. And by the way, it's a strategic weapon for recruitment because smart people we are at full employment. You can argue uh, that data, but I, based on the client base that we have around the world, people are really full up. And that means the best people have choices. The value-driven people who are creative, who are innovative, who aren't afraid to sit and learn new things have choices. And so values that are lived every day in the way we work, as, ex as an example, something that is still stunning to me, Brian. It's really interesting. When we do a uh, an assessment of an organization, we, we were working with a healthcare company a number of years ago. And as part of the assessment, we surveyed the senior leadership team and we asked them, what percentage of your meetings hit their stated goals? And it was stunning. The CEO, I said to the CEO, I said, Tom, I think we found the, the gap here. And he brought the CFO in, and, and the CFO thought that, you know, we had found fruit. It was actually more troubling. Only 28% of the people that responded to our survey in the assessment said that they uh, that their meetings met their uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. So if you want a respectful dialogue and engaged workforce, we've got to make sure those meetings uh, go. So you go ahead, Ken. Yeah, so, the, you know, you talk about culture as a weapon, and I, I, I think that's a brilliant way to to address it because it's not only a weapon that you can use to your advantage, but it's also a weapon that can blow up in, in your face. And uh, one of the things you'll see here on, the, on this slide is you know, Wells Fargo, Boeing, VW. Here's, here are instances where culture went awry. And uh, it seems as though every single week there's a story in the Wall Street Journal that speaks to where a culture got misaligned somehow, where values got misaligned. In the case of, of Wells Fargo, it was the, the management team set very aggressive sales targets. The, uh, the sales executives didn't feel as though they could achieve those targets. And so guess what? Let's start making up uh, accounts. That is a major crisis. And that almost sunk a 160-year-old company. Uh, a bedrock of the financial community. Uh, and Boeing, Boeing's going through this right now with their plant in South Carolina, and uh, you know the whistleblower and some of the stories that are coming out of there. They put uh, speed ahead of safety, whereas the plant in Washington uh, is, is always about safety first, speed to customer second. And so there is uh, there's a lot of these stories that are out there. I mean, we go on and on of Starbucks, Sephora. Uh, KPMG is going through some of this right now. And, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, and we're looking at this, the last bullet here, but you, you have to ask yourself, do we have the strongest culture and the most engaged employees? Because if you do, and we're, we, we firmly believe this, that will lead to you attracting the most, uh, attracting the most aligned customers for your, for your organization. So strong culture, most engaged employees lead to having the, the, the customer alignment. All of these combined will lead to improved performance. And if you wrap around that whole equation, uh, the most compelling message to your stakeholders, key stakeholders, where we're headed, vision, vision, mission, strategy, then you attract the right shareholders and owner alignment. And that is when you've maximized the value of your organization. And uh, that is the key, I think, to everything we're talking about, all these things driving performance and ultimately valuation. Look, look, ultimately, our experience with cultures tells us that if you don't have a clear strategic communication plan in place that is regular and has a rhythm, people, because of the disruptions in 
global situations that are uncontrollable variables, people lose their way. And you can't possibly co-create products and services for customers and listen attentively to those customers if you have trouble. We did get a question here, uh, is the webinar uh, available on tape? And the answer is yes, and we'll keep going to the next slide. On culture and risk. So why is culture a source of risk for boards to consider? Uh, first of all, uh, any board member out there today who's participating or if you are a uh, C-suite officer working with a board, it's very personal. It, it, it's reputational risk. And if the culture in that organization is ethically challenged, uh, then you're putting your own personal reputation uh, on the line in, in a bad way. And if you believe uh, in shareholder value and increasing stakeholder value, uh, then that's part of your obligation, Brian. Yeah, so imagine if you have a pocket of your company. Every company has values. It could be integrity, innovation, collaboration. Imagine if you have a pocket of your company that lacks integrity or lacks innovation, right? So I'll, I'll address innovation. Innovation shortfalls can slow down your, your ship. Your, your smoothly sailing ship down down the, the through the ocean. Innovation shortfalls while they slow the ship and impede the mission and vision. Something like lack of integrity can actually sink that ship altogether. And you, you've seen you've seen it over the years. I mean, it's not uh, I'm not making this up. If you, you know, Lehman, Bear Stearns, uh, you know, we're going back a few years yeah. with this. But uh, lack of integrity can sink the ship. And so if you're not staying on top of these values, uh, you're, you're doing your company a disservice. Um, you have to, you have to uh, see where the world is going with these values and values alignment, and you can choose to ignore it or you can embrace it. Yeah, I would just say, because we can go off on this one on values quite a bit, but the ways to, to measure it are looking at data that's generated from the hotlines, employee turnover, Remember, employees and customers, clients, tell you quite a bit with their feet. And if, in fact, we're losing people, we're losing clients, and we don't understand why, then somebody's got to do a deeper dive to audit and understand uh, what those risks are and what they're implied. We're coming up on the first question, the poll question. We'll put this one up, and it says, how often do you think you should measure the strength of an organization's culture? question to you as participants, a chance for you to participate, uh, is how often do you think you should measure strength of an organization's culture? Annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly, or never? Brian, what do you think uh, our uh, folks are going to say? Well, I, I have what I hope they're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but reality might be a, an entirely different thing. Uh, but I, I think there's... Uh, I think there's an answer that that should be. I don't want to influence anybody's. Uh, I don't want to buy. We're in the research business. I don't want to uh, bias anybody's answer. I'm going to jump up and scream with joy. You didn't want to influence. You want you want the integrity of the process to go. Right. Uh, my sense is that uh, asking questions about culture is a tough one to ask, and we don't in our world we don't see it asked as frequently as we'd like to see it. So here we go. So basically, uh, people are telling us that on a quarterly basis, uh, they think that uh, it should be 60% of the time, 60%, 26% annually, and then it drops off significantly. So at least most of the people who responded said 60% and annually. You could say it's a pretty healthy number. You agree? That's a pretty healthy uh, number. My, my answer mm -hmm. is daily. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, we do this at our our, our organization. Mm -hmm. We're always talking. We're talking about culture every single mm -hmm. day. Yeah. And where we where can we improve culture? Where can we uh, now? Is that appropriate for a sixty thousand employee company? Maybe it's a maybe that gets in the way of business a little bit. Right. But there, uh, the the right answer is somewhere in between, uh, more frequently and a lot more frequently. Yeah, uh, honestly, I think when you deal with large organizations, uh, it's awfully difficult to look at on a day-to-day -day basis. You can distract the CEO pretty fast if you're giving me that data. But I would say on a quarterly basis, a very fair question uh, to ask. I think it really depends on size and scope. So let's it also yeah. depends on if, if you're a if you're a public company and, right. and listening in on this webinar, 
it's it's going to be largely dictated by your investors and how often you're talking about it and thinking about it. Um, but it, to truth be told, it should be something that you're thinking about on a regular basis. I, I ask CEOs all the time uh, how they measure culture and how often they measure culture. And they say, oh, we do it once a year in an employee engagement survey. I said, really? I said, so if you do an employee survey every January and in July something starts going off the rails, how do you identify that? Do you have to wait until the next survey comes along a year later? It, it has to be more, more frequent. Okay, thanks. So we're on to the next slides, uh, slide, challenging governance and uh, board issues. Uh, human uh, capital management, leadership development, uh, to me, uh, a critical issue. Uh, I once served on a Fortune 500 board. Uh, I asked the CEO in a meeting, do we have data on employee turnover? After the meeting, uh, he came up to me and said, uh, asked me to come to his office, which was a beautiful office. It had beautiful uh, marble and a very large uh, desk and couch, and he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know, that's a great question. You're young and experienced. You should be so honored to be on our board. And I said, well, thank you. He said, we don't have time for things like that, you know, tracking employee right. turnover. Well, six months later, we became target of federal investigation. No surprise, it was right in the sector where I was asking for that data. So when we talk about human capital management and the ability to get uh, financial performance, if you take as an example and think about a client we're working with right now, you cannot have a nexus of financial performance, recruitment costs, turnover costs, and holding on to a client who are sophisticated people and knowing that client if you have a spinning door. And so when we talk about these issues and cultural risk issues, there is a direct correlation to financial P&L uh, performance. I'm going to give you some data and share it with uh, our group here and then ask you to comment on this. Uh, and, and it comes in the area of impact of cultural deficiencies, strong word. Only 27% of employees strongly believe in their company's values. Now, if you're a CEO of a large organization, that would cause me to lose quite a bit of sleep. And as an investor, I would say, holy cow, that beautiful annual report may not be reflective of what people are thinking. The cost and negative impact of cultural def deficiencies, up to 40% loss in valuation. Honestly, that movie uh, that was uh, about uh, Theranos, that's kind of making its way around, I think, Netflix right now, is so troubling to watch because the loss of valuation, people, uh, the allegations, if they are proven out in the court of law, uh, took hundreds of millions of dollars. But many people's lives, and I'll call it patients, who deserve the better day and efficacy and important issues, 40 uh, the allegation is 40 cancer patients that were waiting for uh, therapeutic responses, never got the uh, right response. And so every time we, we, you hear, well, that was Enron, Sarbanes has gone too far, or something else, there are, and you gave us three or four examples of current stories in the marketplace. So serious loss of valuation, and I will say that once you lose your reputation, it will never happen. And then you say, well, are you engaged? Are you? We talk about it now for a moment of time, Brian. Uh, if you're not losing sleep, if you're not 24-7 for your clients, I don't know how you can compete today. And so 35% of U.S. managers are engaged in their jobs. So you want to talk about having better P&L responsibility? How about just focusing on your own people, their wellness, their ability to perform, their I'll call it access to learning opportunities like we're having today. And then uh, when you have those operating margins, they can be 3x higher. All of this, though, boils into, in, in our experience, of creating a CEO dashboard that helps in, if you can visualize a one page of Bri, that's got four or five different metrics on it, and that becomes the dashboard. And then he or she is C CEO. Uh, manifest that through the entire organization so people know what they're being held accountable for. And to me, that's clear line uh, discussion. Yeah, no, absolutely. If uh, This slide actually says it all. If, this, if you don't believe after reading these statistics, 
and talking about the things that we've talked about, if you don't believe this is a CEO or director dashboard item, uh, we've, we've failed as communicators. 100%. 100%. And and we have to have the courage sitting around in executive session to say, you know what, I'm not exactly sure that's the right dashboard issue. And, and if you take it in that kind of context. The next slide talks about strategy and culture and the very important link. And for our school here, a lot of people have great breathtaking visions of the future. And they have really cool strategy. We've, you know, we compete in the strategic world. Can't tell you how many times we've come behind very large consulting firms, big brands, 400 page document on strategy. Honest to God, nobody gave any thought to how they were going to implement that strategy. And I think embedded in our practical conversation is how the heck you implement it. And I think where Brian is bringing incredible insights into the conversation is by creating data, that is measurable, independently collected, and then you have the uh, appropriate construct. And we would observe that you get ownership. We had a very large professional services firm uh, that uh, Kelly and myself worked on strategy uh, the last couple of years, global corporation, and the CEO insisted on including 5,000 associates around the world in the data collection to understand their markets, what was important to them, and then taking that, and that became the inclusion of a very successful professional services firm, but moving them to the next generation. You know what? Their revenues are up almost 50% this year, Brian, because more people felt uh, heard, included, and of course, with a large firm, you can't have everybody making every decision, but making sure the implementation is tied to inclusion and that sharing the vision and dusting off the mission becomes a critical uh, component of that. And, 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 communicate, and communicating about it uh, both internally and externally is crucial. 100%. Uh, are you, are your, is your culture talked about on your website? Think about your website. Uh, think about your materials that you that you send out either to customers or to uh, investors if you're a public company. Uh, are you talking about mission, vision, values, and how you live those values? Because that's what ultimately is going to align you internally and externally with with customers and with your with your own people, and ultimately shareholders too. And 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 if you can't describe as a person. Mission, in our definition, is purpose. What's your purpose for coming to work every day? Mm -hmm. And if you want to inspire and engage people who will then engage your customer base, then we have a shared responsibility to make sure we get that right. Especially the millennial generation. They 100%. are all about purpose. 100%. Next poll question. Is your organization's strategic plan, including vision, mission, core values, being strategically communicated on a regular basis to ensure engagement? Yes, no, sometimes, not sure. Brian, you're going to wear me out, but what do you think? How do you think people are going to respond to this uh, this, this question? Uh, well, again, I I'm here I'm going to hope that the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I want everyone to be honest that's uh, that's answering this question. Be be totally candid about uh, it, is it is it happening on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And if and if it's not, it's okay. Right. Uh, it's Correct. That's fine. So, so, so this here we go. So, forty-five percent said yes. Twenty-five percent no. Twenty-eight percent sounds a little random to me. So you could make the case that over half of the people who are participating here are basically saying that the organization's strategic plan is not communicated, or I'll just put a sub-bullet, discussed on a regularized basis. And then you wonder why people get so disrupted, so distracted uh, because of this very point. And we talk about str commu uh, strategic communication. It's not press releases. It's pithy, direct conversations, being direct, coming right off the CEO or a business unit leader's desk to people, not 400 pages long, but half a page, 
every week. Here's an update. Here's what it implies. And by the way, I'm interested in your conversations uh, about that. So let's go to the next one. Culture is a strategic weapon. Brian, I know you have some thoughts here. Yeah. I, so listen, value, we, we, we've talked about this quite a bit, but values alignment is the key ingredient in what I would call the culture soup, right? We're, we're, we're constantly uh, simmering uh, uh, the soup on the, on the stove here. And when I said earlier, you know, bring it from the walls to the, to the halls, this is it. Uh, you know, many companies that we work with spend an inordinate amount of time and money on defining their values. They, they throw them up on the wall and they say, okay, our, we, we did it. We did our values uh, assessment and uh, we put them on the walls and we put, we have these nice little posters and everybody needs to just adhere to these. And it, that's, that's where, that's just the very, very, very beginning. If you think about the tip of the iceberg, uh, that's where, that's where it starts. But all of the, uh, all, everything that's underneath that is what, uh, yeah, it needs to be measured across the entire organization. Make sure every employee lives and breathes the values on an, on an ongoing basis. Not once a year, but all the time. Got new employees, uh, tenured employees, got U.S. employees, international employees, executives, clerical, everyone. And when outside people see this, uh, you attract more of the same. I, I'm a, Stuart, I'm a firm believer in uh, the law of attraction. What, what you put out into the world is what you get back. You know, if you think about your friends, it's, they all kind of reflect who you are as, as a person and, and they share the same values you share. That's why they're your friends. Um, you know, the, the business is no different. Um, but, but as, as I said before, investors are asking these questions. You know, if you're, and if you're private, your banks are, are asking these 100%. questions, right? So you're, um, you need to be talking about it on a more regular basis. Look, in a practical sense, because we're talking about values quite a bit here because culture sits on values, but even something as fundamental as interviewing for new people to come into your organization. You know, for me, I, I recommend, we recommend uh, as a firm, when you're going to hire people, just hold up your values and ask people how they relate to them. Ask them specifically there are no trick questions here. It's like, hey, this is what we believe in. And if you don't get a good instinctive sense that this is what those folks believe in, guess what? Don't hire that person because you're doing them and their family a disservice and you're introducing the potential of great toxicity into a culture that we will all want to be very protective of. Mm -hmm. And that honestly comes down to a standards thing. And I always used to say, uh, if I was not comfortable bringing a person into my home to meet my family for dinner, then I'm not so sure I'd be hiring that person in a leadership role. And and that's what it looks like at the ground. That's what we need to train all of our people to embrace. Then we get the implementation of strategy. We got a question. Do you believe culture trumps strategy in the hallways of most uh, companies? Uh, to me, a very uh, who was it? Who was it that said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast? Yes, absolutely. There was yeah. uh, I forget who said that. I have to look that up. Right. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Culture culture uh, drives everything. Now, strategy has to be uh, based off of the culture, totally. right? Like like I said before, yeah, you know, the the culture. Uh, you have a strong culture. You'll check the right people. The, the right people attract the right customer. And all of that leads to uh, to performance if you have the right strategy as placed. But it's it's a, it's almost like a chicken egg scenario. But I think one plays very heavily into the other. How can you have a strategy if you don't have the right culture there that can carry it out? Right. You you know what? We're living in a world where there is ultimate transparency, and you can check somebody out, and you can check me out in five seconds today. Transparency is a reality. And so when you talk about a culture trumping strategy, the culture is the way we act every day. If we're not going to be honest, if we're not going to try hard, if we're not going to fulfill an obligation to have the report ready on Friday, uh, ready to go, uh, those actions uh, dilute any strategy that you have and, frankly, it derail it and it becomes a wasteful, uh, I'll call it, uh, exercise. 
Next slide talks about why transforming culture is uh, critical. Note I wrote 70% of uh, team engagement comes from leadership creating a healthy culture. See, it's not your words, it's your actions. It's are you going to be honorable and in a transparent way in business? We all make decisions on who we're going to do business with, who we're going to associate with. It's incredibly important to our own uh, raison d'etre. Uh, we had a situation, Kelly and myself, recently where you know we weren't comfortable in a particular uh, situation where a client wanted to retain us for something. And you know what? We walked away because I could never look at the people in our firm or our client base and that's a critically important thing. In healthcare, the consequences are more steep. If you're not fulfilling your mission and you're looking at, but not looking at what are the milligrams dosage on a protocol, and instead of 100 milligrams, you're uh, infusing 1,000, the consequences can be very unpleasant. And the transfer of staff infections, and that's why those protocols become important. Universal, and so when you look out, at uh, the criticality of st uh, strategy, but having an empowered culture is, in truth, uh, the way to go. And I believe, even more important, for millennials who really want to understand uh, what their purpose is. And so when you deploy capital two ways, financial capital and human capital, that people have a chance to increase their skills, increase their learning, and I'll call it strengthen the organization and our capacity uh, to move forward. Brian, you want to take a swing at that? You good? Next question, poll question. Uh, how often does your organization measure values, i.e., whether every member of your organization lives its core values? This is really a tester. How often does your organization how, yeah, how, how often does your organization measure values of alignment? Whether every member of your organization lives its core values, okay? And so let's take a minute and see what uh, comes out of that. Brian, you want to take a uh, guess on that, baby? I just whispered it in your ear. Uh, nice. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's being very discreet. <laughs> All right. I, you know, look, this, this is a very serious question, I think, because it tells us uh, ultimately um, what your potential is. And we were talking earlier 50%, 50 percent, five zero, fifty percent of Fortune 500 companies go away every decade, and right here is the core of that destruction of shareholder value. Yeah, you shared that with me recently, mm -hmm. and that blew me away. Yeah. So here you go. So does your organization measure values annually? 33 percent, quarterly 13 percent, never 51 percent. Holy no. mackerel, 51%, yeah, right. I never measure right. the core value. That, right. that aligns right. when, when I talk to CEOs. Right. I, I ask, how often do you measure values alignment? They say, they'll say they say, we measure, um, we measure, we have an engagement survey. They'll say, we do 360 surveys. Uh, but when I ask them how they measure values alignment, it's always met with a pause. They yeah. say, well, we don't. Right. Um, it's the most critical piece, Stuart. Okay. Uh, so, so, you know, do you, so, do you share yeah. our values? Well, and, and 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 so the takeaway here is is twofold. One, the way you can talk to that CEO is say, Hey, look. Number one, do you see employee turnover? Number two, do you see how many people fail a fishing a technology fishing fishing exercise, which tells us whether in fact they embrace our mission and and share our uh, beliefs and and how we're going to go for, further. We do that. We do that at our company. We do that uh, once a, once a quarter. Right? We uh, the fishing exercise. Okay. So so let's go to the next page here. Measuring your values. And by the way, one of our informed uh, listeners, Lou Moderano. Thanks, Lou. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Attributed to Michael Porter. Okay. There you have. Thank you. We have informed All right. people here. You ask the question, we get it. Measuring values and 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 ultimately. It's what do you do with the data? And you know, when we do an assessment of a board, Kelly and myself and our team, uh, and you ask questions, and I'm thinking about one that we did a year ago, a very high profile corporate board, and the uh, chairman said, everything's great, everybody's great, first couple of directors, great. But then you started to ask questions, and effectively, it's like holding up a mirror and having people look in the mirror and say, gee whiz, what is this about? And so measuring values, and then what do you do with uh, the data, and how does it work its way onto the dashboard, in our view, becomes uh, critically important. 
Yeah. So we were talking about this uh, a couple weeks ago, and I asked you, why is nobody measuring values alignment? Mm -hmm. Did you do you remember what you said to me? Yeah. No. You said because until recently nobody's made the link between values yeah. and performance. There you go. That's a wise statement. <laughs> it is though. <laughs> You're a sage man. <laughs> no, it is. It is important. And and honestly, I think that it, it, that's all being driven by this discussion of social capitalism and the transformation of society, where people are now asking, I'll call it more direct questions about understanding the workings of an organization. So I think there is a, a nexus in that conversation. So uh, evidence-based assessments, uh, culture with strategy, organization, uh, core values, and, and things that we've been talking about. Next slide. Data is not knowledge. This, this Brian, I, honestly, you know, in, in one of my books, uh, we developed this uh, chapter on data is not knowledge because it's like any other data point in life. You can look at it. You can look at your savings account and say, okay, this is how much I have in the bank, and that's data. And if you don't ask the question, well, what does that imply for me saving money for my children's education or – uh, weddings or other family functions. In other words, data standing unto itself, the data you collect every day professionally in your firm, which is independently driven and trusted, if it just stands by itself, <clears throat> what the heck does it mean? And so when you look at these discussions about uh, risk valuation and acting on changes required in, in our world, you're not going to get to wisdom if you don't have the character to say, okay, wow, this is what we heard from our customers. And by the way, we did work for a very large Silicon Valley uh, manufacturer routers a couple of years ago. And we started to get data from the customers as to what products and services they wanted. And when we started to talk about strategically, okay, this is what we heard from our customer base, but how are we going to co-create products and services with our customers? And internally, the organization culture seized because they couldn't embrace it until we really had to look very hard and say, okay, if you're willing to give up the business, the total business, and not understand what the customers are asking for in the future, you know what, in about two or three years, because of technology, we're done. And so that's a graphic example of something we saw but go ahead, Murray. Yeah, so we say this all the time. Uh, data without action is useless. Right. And action without data is dangerous. Right. So we always liken it to a physical. Think about think about every year you go for a physical. Well, hopefully you go every year for a physical. Uh, comes back and says you have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And they give you markers about where you should be and they tell if you have an, have an issue or not. Uh, then you seek out a trainer and nutritionist to get you back on track. And the trainer will put you on a regimen, the nutrition, nutritionist will change up your diet, and lo and behold, you measure again and you see you've made improvement on your scores for blood pressure and, and cholesterol. The business is exactly the same. Uh, you know, we're talking about the health of your organization. Uh, and like I said, data without action is useless, and action without data is dangerous. And uh, yeah. you got you got to live in that in that world. We, we were uh, laughing about it before we went on, but I sat on a board of a particular company, and in the morning uh, for breakfast, we used to have two day old bagels and cream cheese and other fattening things. And finally, one day, we got into a discussion about wellness programs, and I asked, well, does that extend to the board? <laughs> and my point of that was, in healthcare, where the healthcare trends go today, there is a, I'll call it self-reliance and an important responsibility to take care of yourself and your family and your employee base. And it's manifest uh, in wellness, but you can see a lot based on how people are serving food, what's the availability, ability. I mean, you look at Bloomberg, they built their franchise uh, on, on uh, those type of actions and they're, uh, I'll call it actionable, and, and I think they're important. And so those type of discussions uh, become, I think, critical. So it's data, 
It's not knowledge unless you can implement it, unless you share it with people, and unless you're able to move forward as a unified uh, uh, team. And, and to us, that becomes a critical uh, calculus. And if there's any takeaway uh, from these conversations, it's how you craft those CEO dashboards so that people know what's important to you and then can build out their responsibilities uh, moving forward. Okay, Brian. So we got a great question, uh, more of a comment than yeah. a question. Sid, so to be fair, the U.S. military long ago cracked the code on the connection between culture, strategy, and performance. And yes, absolutely, uh, this is practiced in the military quite a bit. Why is it not being practiced in our organizations, which are uh, you know, thriving machines in, in industry, and it, it's a great it's a gr great observation. Uh, there's there's a lot of lessons we can take from the military. There's something we do at Ravel called red teaming, which is practiced by the Israeli military, and that is it's almost like devil's advocate. Um, but there are teams. The, the best organizations have teams of people that are devoted to uh, what they call red teaming, which is coming up with everything that could possibly go wrong with a new idea, a new campaign, um, et cetera. And so, yeah, we could take a lot of lessons from the military. You, you can be sure if your values are not aligned in the military, uh, you're not going to have a, uh, a machine that's going to protect you. Yeah, I, I will tell you this, uh, Michael, this might come as a shock if you get to know me. Uh, got this question about the military. Uh, I used to drive a tank in, in the United States Army. And the one thing that you learn in a tank or in the military is there are consequences. When you put a full clip, a loaded clip, into an M16 and there was a misfire, there were consequences. And there was a discipline around respect that certain things were not tolerated vis-a-vis uh, -vis actions. And by the way, whether it was wellness for, uh, call it the uh, people in the military, or discipline or clarity around what the mission is. I watched the Army football team almost take out uh, Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and I heard the commanding general of West Point, the superintendent, talk about we go onto the field as a unit, and I knew exactly what he was talking about, and I knew Michigan, Michigan was in trouble because in the military, if you really talk to military people, uh, they will tell you it's understanding with clarity that everybody in the entire company understands, not company organization, 42 people understands what the purpose is, whose job, and by the way, you definitely have a responsibility for your brother or sister who happens to be in the foxhole with you. It's really clear and it's ingrained in basic training right through uh, whatever uh, school that you go for. And that, honestly, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm always available and our firm is uh, in a voluntary basis to help military people who retire uh, because their leadership skills are 100% superior based on uh, the training. Let's do a very fast summary here and go to the uh, page that talks about are you focused enough on culture? Uh, is your culture on the dashboard? Uh, for me, uh, senior leadership positively impacting on the culture uh, through its actions and strategic communication. <laughs> Uh, if you take a couple of uh, conversations away today, uh, number one, making sure there is clarity. Everything starts at the top. The board and the CEO design the dashboard. What are those three or four metrics? Employee turnover, customer satisfaction, financial performance, whatever the heck it is. Clarity, and then people know. So you debunk. People say, where are we going? You look at uh, that dashboard, and that becomes, I'll call it, cultural uh, certainty. Brian, any 30-second uh, closing thoughts on, as you look at the summary page? Uh, no, the, the only thing I can, the, the only thing I'm thinking of is ask yourself, are you doing all that's necessary to strengthen your culture? Um, whether you're a manager, whether you're a CEO, or whether you're chairman of the board or lead director, ask yourself, are we doing everything possible or is there more that we could be doing? Yeah. And and that's it. And that's the question I I ask my clients all the time: is, is are you uh, are are you living it and breathing the things that you say? So um, the, I think the answer is uh, everybody who's joined Outcall today, and all of us uh, in the room over here, and thank 
uh, Passageways and Tarta Krinsky again for their hospitality. But for me, it's do we have the courage and the will to learn as fast as the world is changing? And to me, that's a powerful question because you can only really participate in value creation if you've made an intellectual commitment to continue to learn. The people that came onto our webinar today made that commitment, and Brian and myself have so much respect for that. And Brian, on behalf of uh, our team and yours, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank Guy Molinari and the people at Tarta Krinsky and Kelly and Harriet for your preparation. And with that, uh, Michael and Mohanish, uh, we're proud to be associated with you guys. Uh, we're going to throw it back to you for closing thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you very much for Brian for such great insights and, I mean, really just powerful ideas. You've definitely given uh, all of us and I'm sure everyone attending some great inspiration and a lot to think about. So thank you. Well, everyone, that's all we have time for today. So on behalf of Onboard, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And of course, I especially want to thank again, Stuart Levine and Brian Ravel for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, we will be sending out a link to the recording of today's webinar, as well as the presentation sure. to everyone who attended. So be on the lookout for that. We would love everyone's feedback, so please do take a minute to fill out the survey at the end. Your input matters a great deal, so please fill that out when you see it. And then thank you again for joining us, and we bid you a very cordial good afternoon. Thank you.